So in Utah, we have an, another story of uh, the police overreacting and using far too much force. Well, in fact, someone died. Uh, and we're gonna show you, the, unfortunately, the video on it because I want you guys to see so we can begin to fix the system. In this case, um, it's uh, it's actually a white person who's shot uh, by the police. We're gonna talk about racial issues and class issues uh, after you find out what the story is about. So let me tell you. Um, as PBS writes, Chad uh, Breinholt showed up intoxicated to his girlfriend's workplace. Her work, co-worker called the police. Okay, so far this sounds normal. The officers don't see Brian Holt behind the wheel, but surveillance footage showed that he had driven a car. Brian Holt blew a blood alcohol level of 0.162, more than three times Utah's legal limit of 0.05. Uh, Lane uh, arrested him, that's of course the officer uh, uh, in this story, uh, there's a several officers, but he's arresting one. Uh, he searched his pockets and found no weapons. Uh, Brian Holt was placed in a patrol car, according to the footage. Okay, so now this is important. He goes over to his uh, girlfriend's workplace. He's definitely intoxicated. I watched a very long video on it. There's no question he's drunk, and then he uh, he blows three times the legal limit. So uh, the officers, in talking to him, apprehending him. Um, and, and they had pretty good evidence that he had driven there. They, they've done nothing wrong so far. So they should arrest him and, and they bring him in. And he he's in bad shape when he gets to the um, police station. In fact, at one point, he falls down on the ground handcuffed and they let him lie there for 11 minutes. So there's bad things happen before you get to the end. But let me give you more from the story from PBS. Um, officers spent nearly two hours with Brian Holt in the DUI processing room at police headquarters. Sergeant Tyler Longman wasn't part of the initial arrest, but came to the police station because Lane and Atkin were newer officers who needed help filling out an electronic warrant. The video shows that Brian Holt asked officers to take him to the Huntsman Mental Health Institute, known as UNI, but the officers refused. So at one point, he says that he's having, I think he said heart issues, but clearly, some health issues that he falls to the ground. They call the fire department because they have a medical team. They check him out and they say, no, he's not having a heart attack or anything like that. They put him back in the chair. Um, but he says, look, and you could tell he is very intoxicated and he is not doing well at all. And they tell me they're gonna take him to prison. And by the way, if you're arrested for a DUI when when you it, it looks like you did it, you, you should eventually be taken to prison. But the guy is not well, and you it is abundantly clear in the video. And so when he asked to be taken to some sort of medical facility, common sense is screaming through the video. Everybody watching it, please, please just take him to a doctor's office or to uni or something along those lines. Let him sober up, then take him to prison, just in case, right? And it's also trouble, let alone the fact that he might have a serious health condition. And, and police officers often seem to be think that everybody's lying when they say they have a medical condition. And I'm sure some folks that they bring in do lie about that. But why are you taking chances with so many people die in custody? But now in this case, unfortunately, he did not die from a health condition. Um, he kept trying to get out of the situation to get to go to uni. Uh, uh, and, and so he started saying he had a gun. Now remember earlier in the story, I told you, um, that they patted him down and they were positive he didn't have a gun. He says he's got one in his shoe, etc. And then as they're checking his shoe, a scuffle happens and then disaster, okay? Now, if you're faint of heart, I don't blame you at all. And even if you're not faint of heart, I'm gonna give you a significant warning on this video. The reason we have to show it to you is that so you can see that this happens all the time. And then there's a twist at the end of the story, which makes it even worse. But so when folks tell you the police are doing this, believe them because they are. Uh, now let's see with that warning in mind, uh, let's watch the video. Is the gun in my shoe? Okay, sit down. The gun in my shoe. Okay, sit down. All right. I'll get the gun out. You sit down. No, I'm gonna sit down. Okay, stay seated. It's in my seat. Okay, good job. Thanks for sitting. Yeah, Stay down. Okay. Stay seated. All right. You don't want to fight with me. You definitely don't want to fight with this guy. Just sit your ass and stay. Okay. You're not letting me go. No, we're not letting you go. 
for now. For what? We told you it'll still be a few minutes before you can go anywhere. For what? Before we go to jail. Tell you what, give me your shoe. No. Yeah. No. I'm giving you my shoe. A scuffle ensues. Longman watches. I'm going to tell you an amazing fact about uh, the the policeman who shot him there uh, in a little bit. But uh, I watched that video many times to see if he actually had the gun. He did not. He touched the gun. That's definitely that seems to be the case from the video. And so was the officer concerned that he was going to be able to get it out of it, the holster? Yeah, I can see him being concerned. Did he get it out of the holster? He did not. He never got it out of the holster. And so uh, and the last words he heard was the officers telling him, you're about to die, my friend. Okay, I have more on the story, but first I want to bring everybody in here. So, Bridget, um, this is obviously happening all across the country. Um, they, don't, they don't seem to have any reform. What's your take on this? Yeah, that video is so hard to watch and so heartbreaking. And I think it, it's worth mentioning that the reason why law enforcement was called in the first place is that. When he showed up to his girlfriend's place of work, she was concerned about self harm. He talked about having taken a handful of pills, you know, drinking. And so, obviously, if somebody has, you know, been drinking and driving, they should probably, you know, have some sort of penalty for that. But clearly, if you're worried about self harm, taking him right to jail and having this kind of interaction, there's no cause for it. And so, you know, seeing this video, seeing the way that these officers treated him, seeing him say several times that he wanted to go to a mental health facility and having those pleas be just ignored or sort of mocked by these officers, it's really disgusting. And I think. I think that more training is not the answer. I think that reform is not the answer. This is not a situation of a few bad apples. I think it's a situation of a, a rot at the root. And yeah, I don't think training or reform is going to fix any of this. It's a, it's a deeply systemic problem. Jackson. Yeah, I think um, one of the important things to highlight is that at no point was law enforcement not in control of the situation. At no point did he serve any type of real threat to any of their lives. He was handcuffed, he was in the facility, there were multiple police officers. They were kind of provoking him the whole time. As you could see, they weren't really listening to his pleas to get him to a different type of facility. And after he shot him, he's dead, you know what I'm saying? Like, And it really just shows that law enforcement in general in this country really is not prepared to do much else other than use force. And so unfortunately, unless bills get passed, nothing will change. And there's really not very much political will within the walls of Congress to pass any type of bills. And what makes this even more complicated is it's not really something that a federal sweep could just fix because police departments are ran locally and there's thousands of them. So, you know, this, got, this is a historical problem, this is a cultural problem, and it's something that you know, unless we get money out of politics in some significant way, I don't really see how anything is gonna happen, unfortunately. Yeah, and in this case, it's oftentimes the police unions that pour in a ton of money uh, to local candidates and, and prevent change. And that's why Jackson brings that up. I just wanna add a couple of things that, uh, to add on to what uh, Jackson and Bridges said and then give you a couple more facts. So first of all, I, I think uh, the number one problem is the, the threshold for killing, right? So I always think shoe on the other foot, what, what if I was in the situation of the police officers and so, if, this guy who was looking for help, but is in bad shape and is not in the right state of mind, grabs the gun of one of my best friends, but he hasn't pulled it out yet, right? Would I murder that guy? And I don't think I would. I, I, I don't think a lot of you would, I hope you wouldn't, right? You'd be really, really worried and the first thing I would do is I would grab his hand, right? You got three officers there, he's not a big guy, he's obviously very drunk. I would, you know, if he grabbed for the gun, I would go and grab his arm. I wouldn't think I'm gonna end this guy's life rather than take whatever the percentage is, 1%, 2%, 5%, 10% chance that he might get the gun, use the gun and harm one of us. 
But that is not what police are taught. Police are taught, put him down, who cares? His life is not anywhere near as important as not just your life, but any degree of safety for you, right? So if you feel slightly unsafe, kill him. And and God, Bridget made such a great point. And it reminded me of the Richard Sherman story. Originally, they get called in for self harm. We want to protect this guy. But the cops, when all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So they're not looking to, did it look like they were looking to help him? No, if you watch that whole long video, they weren't looking to help him at all. In fact, they were mocking him as he was asking for help. But you got called in for help. And that's why it's called defund the police, because some of the money should actually go to mental health and and other kinds of health treatment for these people. Richard Sherman, the famous NFL player, his wife calls in and says, please, please don't kill him. I'm worried about him, he had two bottles and I don't want him to harm himself, but please don't kill him, right? And that's what now everybody has to say to cops when they're calling them, that's crazy. So now this video didn't get released for two years, why? Of course, everybody knows it's CYA, cover your ass. They didn't want you to see the video because the video is horrible. And so, but they saw two years ago, did they take action? Of course not. West Valley City's Incident Review Committee determined Longman, the shooter, didn't violate policy and he's back on duty after being on administrative leave, which is standard protocol after a police shooting. His actions are also defended by Utah's Fraternal Order of Police, as always. Now, the last story, part of the story that I promised you, that's horrible. Sergeant Tyler Longman has no serious record of disciplinary actions and over time has been promoted to sergeant. What he does have is a record of firing his gun. Public records show Longman has not faced discipline for three fatal shootings. He killed three different people in three different incidents. And he has never received any discipline. They thought all of those, including that video you just watched, were exemplary. That is, that's what he should have done. And so one more time, Bridget and Jackson, if cops look at that video, we look at the video and the audience can judge for themselves, but I imagine a huge percentage are horrified. Cops look at it and go, well done. Well, of course they're gonna do it again. You just told them that it was well done. Absolutely, and you make such a good point that police unions, oftentimes they're just protecting their own. They are not looking out for public safety. They are not looking out for citizens and public good. And I think a system, a criminal justice system, where a police officer can kill three people and be promoted and be told good job and is still walking around there with a gun, tells you all you need to know about how committed that system is to public safety. They're not committed at all. And I think, um, you know, this is, I know, Jank, you're from, uh, or you grew up out here in Jersey. I'm out here in Jersey. And the other day, I was in, uh, if you're familiar with Montclair, yep. you know, pretty well to do area. There's, you know, you're not living in most of Montclair if you don't got a couple million bucks at least. And I'm looking at these Hummers and these armored police vehicles riding around like, what do you need all this for? What? And, and then I was at a friend's house and this movie SWAT was on. And how unbelievably politicized that movie is. And, you know, you just got to think that a lot of this behavior comes from people who want that action adrenaline type lifestyle. They look at these types of movies, they imagine themselves as these heroes fighting the bad people. And as goofy as that seems, that's literally what ends up getting into these police departments. And, you know, how do you really put the genie back in the bottle when these people have access to the most, you know, military grade weapons? When they have access to tanks that they can ride around in, in areas where there's really no crime, you know, so it's just the that that bad boy, you know, let's go get the bad guys culture really dominates police in this country, and it attracts a certain type of person. Yeah, and so lastly, I promise you guys, race and class discussion. So I just real quick on that because we don't have time to get into the whole conversation about that. But the answer is both. It's not either, right? So do our does this happen to African Americans more often? Yes, that's a fact. It's a statistically proven fact, right? But does it happen to poor people more often as well? Oh, yes, that's also definitely statistically true. So when Jackson's talking about the those highly militarized police in Montclair, they're not going to do this to wealthy folks. It, it almost never happens to wealthy folks. It happens to people who they view as threats to the property of Montclair, 
right? Yes. And so is it is it a racial issue oftentimes? Absolutely. But is it also a class issue? So will they kill poor and middle class white people because they've been taught? You know, you're supposed to be militarized and you're supposed to never take 1% chance with your life, etc. Absolutely. And so even though that is horrible and and we feel for both black and white and everybody else that are the victims of this, maybe there's a silver lining there as what happened with a little bit of reform in criminal justice on the issue of drugs when oxy took over the country and it started we started locking up more and more white people unjustly as we were doing to african americans all of a sudden republicans jumped in and thought maybe we should rethink this right and democrats of course are useless and always look for permission from republicans so there's some chance here that the more videos you see like this that republicans might go huh, maybe this isn't such a good idea after all and then we might finally get some action on this issue. But we should have honest politicians that take action without any of that being necessary, as Jackson pointed out earlier. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.